The Gospel of John, chapter 5, beginning in verse 1, concluding in verse 8. Can I get a reader this morning to stand up and read the word as if our life depended on it? Because rightfully speaking, our life does depend on it. Amen. 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 Let's stand for the reader of the gospel. Amen. Amen. Are we ready? Amen. Yes. Let's read. Afterward, Jesus returned to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish holy days. Inside the city near the Sheep Gate, there was a pool of the Bethesda with five covered porches. Mm -hmm. Four crowds of sick people, blind, lame, or paralyzed, lay on the porches. One of the men laying there had been sick for 38 years. When Jesus saw him, he knew that he had been ill for a long time. He asked him, would you like to get well? I can't, sir, the sick man said, for I have no one to put me into the pool when the water bubbles up. Someone else always gets there ahead of me. Jesus told him, stand up, pick up your mat, and walk. Spirit of the living God, this morning, we exalt, we choose to exalt your name. We choose this morning to maximize the time we have together collectively as your body. We say thank you, Lord. We say we love you, Lord. And as you open up your word this morning, I pray that you would hide the messenger behind the cross. I pray, Lord, that you would hijack my mind and my tongue. Express your love and your concern for your people. I give you praise and I thank you. It's in Jesus' name. Somebody say amen. 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 You may be seated in the house of the Lord. This morning, thank you for reading, Sister Erica. This morning, our text, it picks up with a man who has been in a certain situation for almost 40 years. Jose, how old are you? 29. 29. Add, add mm, about nine more years with that. Mm -hmm. This man. The Bible does not record his name. He's just known as a man who has been in a certain situation for nearly 40 years. For 38 years, this man has not been mobile. He has not been able to walk. This man has not been able to get around on his own. For 38 years, this man has been dependent on the compassion and, and grace of others to get around. You see, for example, in order for this man to take a bath, someone else has to bathe him. In order for this man to clothe, to get clothed in the morning, someone else must take the time to help him to put his clothes on. In order for this man to get around, someone else must make a decision taking time out of their day, going out of their way to transport him to where he needs to go. In order for this specific man to eat, someone else must give him money and sometimes prepare the meal for him. To illustrate this morning how bad this man's situation was, we can look at our own life. Because truth be told, periodically, every once in a while, we can look back at our life honestly and see that there have been times in our own life where we have failed on hard times and needed some type of assistance. Whether it was an unforeseen expense, sudden sickness, loss of a job, or an untimely death, hard times have a way of finding us all. But this man this morning, 38 years, his entire life 
has been nothing but hard times. The Bible states that he has lived in this condition for 38 years with the single hope of being made well if someone else puts him in the water when it is stirred by an angel. The Bible tells us that this man has positioned himself around a pool called Bethesda. That pool, Bethesda. <clears throat> it's known as the house of mercy. Come to find out though, while we're into our text, at this pool that this certain man is at, he is not alone. Mm -hmm. You see, at this pool, the Bible tells us that there lay a great crowd of folks who are also diseased. They're blind, they're lame, and paralyzed. These folks are also disabled and are waiting with the same hope as this unnamed disabled man, which is to be the first one in the pool when the water is stirred. We need to ask ourselves this morning a question. Looking at the situation, hmm. <clears throat> who, might I ask, who was in any type of position to really help this man? We don't know when the water was stirred, Erica. We don't know. There was no time frame given to us, Robin, as to when the water is stirred. Pops, there were no alerts given by text message or BIA uh, 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 email to notify of when and if the water is stirring. With not knowing when the water would be stirred. Think about this for a minute. Not knowing with not knowing when the water would be stirred, what able-bodied person has the time to wait with this disabled man for the water to move? I mean, think about that for a minute. Just because they brought him down there doesn't mean the water's going to move. You can, they had been dropping them off every day and picking them up at night. But who's in a position to, to what able person is in a position to have the time to wait with this disabled man for the water to move? What do you mean, Pastor? What I'm saying is, let's not be so spiritual for a minute. People have jobs and families. The sick man's relatives, they had bills and priorities, and they had other dilemmas that were taking up most of their time, just like we do. But not only that, the question needs to be asked also, which other disabled person will prioritize his healing over their own need to be made well. Hmm. This man has found fellowship at this pool. He has found camaraderie with the other folks who can understand his physical disadvantages and misfortune of being handicapped. But because only one person can be healed when the water is stirred, he finds himself grouped up with people who are with him but are not for him. Let me know if I'm going too deep. I'll slow it down. What is it like to be with people all around you? You're grouped up with them. They're with you, but they're not for you. I would rather be lonely all alone than to be up under a pretense that we're friends, friends when, in, when in actuality we're, we're trifling adversaries. They're up under the pretense 
That we're all disabled. We're all just trying to make it. I want you to be healed. But once the water stirs, mm, it's every man for himself. You see, at any moment, this peaceful, disabled community that's full of people that are blind, diseased, lame, sick, and paralyzed can break out into a rat race to the water with only one person being made well. Simply put, for 38 years, this man has placed his only hope in a dog-eat-dog system. Mm. A dog-eat-dog system. Inside of this dog-eat-dog system, they tell me you, 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 you pull yourself up by the bootstraps. They say, they tell me that inside this system uh, uh, that you claw your way up while kicking the next man down. When you're in the dog, eat dog world, Miss Gloria, you lie, you steal, you cheat, and fudge numbers to get ahead. In this type of system, the dog, eat dog world, you are rewarded for being the quickest. In the dog, eat dog world, you are rewarded for being the strongest. In this type of system, the dog, eat dog world, you are rewarded for being the smartest. In this type of system, my brothers and sisters, you are applauded for strutting around with your chest out, being the first to cross the finish line. In the dog dog world system. But this type of system is diametrically opposed to the kingdom of God. You're going to miss this message. I pray that you get the video. Please don't get distracted right now. And I say that because someone here, God changed my message up on me. And I don't like when he do that, but what can I do when I'm delivering the mail? That signified to me that he wants to communicate something uh, to someone here today. And I would hate for you to miss the deposit that the Holy Spirit wants to make in your life because you can't bind distractions. This system, this Dog eat dog world system is diametrically opposed against the kingdom of God. Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 20, verses 26 and 27, he says this to his disciples It shall not be so among you. Whoever would be great among you, let him serve you. And whoever would be first among you, let him be your slave. My brothers and sisters, the kingdom of God is totally opposite of this dog, e dog world system. You see, in the kingdom of God, when you're going up, you're coming down. And when you're going up, when you're going up, you're coming down. It's vice versa in the kingdom. Peter says it another way. He says, therefore, humble yourselves under God's powerful hand so that he may lift you up at the appointed time. Amen. But back to the crippled man. <clears throat> We can imagine, those of us with creative ability, those that don't have it, we can still imagine God gave us a good mind, a sound mind. We can imagine that the first couple of years, that as this crippled man, as he sat at the pool the first couple of years, he had great expectations. I mean, he had zeal. He was zealous. He was anxious. He was positive. He had heard the stories. He had heard the bypassers with the testimonies of the angels stirring the water and other people who had received the healing. But as the water began to bubble, he quickly realized something. 
that he couldn't beat any of the other disabled folks to the water. <laughs> Without the use of his legs, being unable to run, his arms could only drag his legs so far and so fast. Even those who limped could out-top him to the water. They were faster than him. Even those who were blind, even though they could not see, could at least hear the water bubbling and run cautiously to the pool faster than this man could. Even those who were deaf, although they could not hear, they could see the water bubbling and walk faster than this man could. Day, thank you. Day after day, week after week, month after month and year after year, this man is still at the pool with the hope, the singular hope of somehow being the first person to get into the water. For years, this man has tied his only hope of being made well to a dog-eat-dog -dog system. This dog-eat-dog -dog system, it's a system that rewards great effort. It's a system that rewards hard work. It's a system that honors performance and achievement. It's a system in which we hope to get what we deserve. Mm. Mm. You see, inside of this system, our disabled brother was hoping to be the last person. In the water. No. The first person oh. to be in the water. The first person to be in the pool so that he may get what he deserves, which is the healing. Mm. <laughs> the location of the crippled man is something we need to look at this morning, Brother Tony. He is positioned at the pool that's called Bethesda, which means house of mercy what is mercy you wouldn't be here without it this morning amen do you know what mercy is mercy is not getting what you deserve Mercy is where a person who is violated, who was violated, has the authority, the power, and the right to administer punishment, but chooses not to. This disabled man, follow me, this disabled man is in a race to get what he deserves, but he's at a place. He's at this pool where you don't get what you deserve. Mm -hmm. He's fighting in this race to be number one so that he can get what he deserves. But fate would have it that he's literally located at the place where you don't get what you deserve. Wow. So for 38 years, this man has gotten what he deserves, which is nothing. He hasn't finished first. He has not won a race. He wasn't the first person in the water. He hasn't won the race to the pool. There will be no prize for this man.
man inside of this race. There will be no healing for this disabled man who decided to run this race. All alone, though, he's been getting what he deserves because he's inside of a dog-eat-dog -dog system. <clears throat> inside the dog-eat-dog -dog world system, 1,500 people can run to the water. Only one gets here. There was an artist, some of you might know if you're under 40, his name was Nelly, and he had a very popular catchphrase, and he says, I am number one, because two is not a winner, and three nobody remembers. That's the motto of the dog-eat-dog -dog world. So for all intended purposes, this dog-eat-dog -dog world, this system, has chewed this man up and spit him out. This man has reached a place in his life where he needs to try something different. Can I say to you this morning, when what you're doing isn't working, hasn't worked, and is promising you the same results, it might be time to try something different. There comes a time in a person's life where we wake up and say to ourselves, I can no longer afford to make physical and emotional and financial deposits into someone or something that's promising me no return. <clears throat> the definition, do you know the definition they say of insanity? They say it's doing the same thing over and over again, yet expecting different results. You see, each of us that are here this morning, we were born into that same system, the doggy -e dog world system, due to sin that transferred down to us. From the time that we were able to talk, we have been taught that in order to make something out of yourselves, you need to fight and you need to claw your way all the way to the top. We are taught that you need to work harder than everyone else. You need to outsmart everyone else. You need to be stronger than the next man. You need to be bigger and better. Hard work in itself, there's nothing wrong with hard work. But the type of race for this disabled man Performance is not going to help him. It's the same race that you and I find, found ourselves in before we came to Jesus. Man has been fighting for what we think we deserve. You see? We've been programmed to work hard and demand some type of recompense for our labor. The problem is that all work, all labor, all toiling, apart from knowing God, is sin. And for all, the Bible says, Paul says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Scripture also tells us that there is no one is good. No one in all the world is innocent. No one has ever really followed God's path or even truly wanted to. Everyone, somebody says he's talking about me. He's talking about me. Everyone has turned away. All have gone wrong. No one anywhere has kept on doing what is right, not one. Which leads us to Paul. I'm allowing scripture to interpret scripture now. Paul tells us this. He says, for the wages of sin is death. So the Bible clearly states that every one of us has been working and laboring and from the labor and the hard work, we all have earned a paycheck. Yes. Question though. If God pays us what we deserve, it would be eternal death and separation from God. I ask you this morning, 
Do you really want what you deserve? No. <coughs> Many times you'll hear people fighting <coughs> because in their mind, they're fighting for what they deserve. Because in the world, we all of your relationships in the world are all performance driven to a certain degree. And so when you get saved, you bring that same mindset into the kingdom with you. Me and my wife are arguing about this because she don't believe that all performance are all relationships are performance driven. And what, what do you mean by that, Pastor? Well, my wife loves me to death, but there's a couple of things that I can do that can change how she feels about me real, real quick, you see. See, every, based on performance, God is the only relationship that we have that's not based on performance. So we bring that we bring that old with that old mindset into our new into our new life with Christ and we think that it's all about performance. We think that who we are is what we do. But unfortunately, we see a man this morning who cannot do for himself, who cannot win. His only hope is Jesus. I want to leave you with this on, on mercy. I want to leave you with this on mercy. I know we graduated from mercy and grace. We don't need that no more. We're in search of the, the thrills. We're in search of healings. We're in search of signs and wonders. We no longer acknowledge mercy no more. You see? I'm going to leave you with this saying this morning. I ran out of time. I couldn't go any more into that. But um, Paul is talking to Timothy, his, his son in the Lord. And he tells Timothy this. He says, here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy. So that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his unlimited patience as an example unto those who would believe on him and receive eternal life. Amen. This morning, I don't know who this was for, but you're a human being, not a human doing. This morning, your relationship with God is not based on your performance. Thank you, Lord. It's not based on your performance. We have that, that, uh, you know, that adopted child mindset. I can relate to that because when my grandmother adopted me into the family, I didn't believe that the cookies on the refrigerator were mine. Uh, I believed that I had to work a little extra harder just to get the same meal that everybody else had because naturally I knew she wasn't my mom, but she adopted me and I had a hard time processing that. And so when we come into Christ, sometimes we have a hard time understanding that how can a loving God, a perfect yes. God, a righteous yes. God bend down in all of time and pick me up and save me. Yes. It's one thing for me to believe that he saved me, but it's a another thing in general for me to believe that he loves me, that he's going to support me, that he's going to do for me, that I'm favored, that I'm blessed, that he's called me, that he's anointed me, that he's chosen me for good works. Those are two totally different things. And sometimes we have a hard time believing that. But it's not based on our efforts. It's not based on what we do. It's based on what Jesus has already Amen. done. Amen. But the way we receive mercy is through humility. <laughs> there has to be some admission before there can be some mercy. Given. We have to know that there's an issue. He said, I came for the sick, not for the well. And that means we have to decrease the pride. That means we have to humble ourselves. Amen. There was a pastor, young pastor, who 
worked at a church, and for two years he never got a chance to minister. One Sunday, one Sunday afternoon, the senior pastor said, hey, you're going to be preaching this, this evening, 45 minutes. The young pastor was so excited. He ran back to the pew and he called his mother and all his people. He said, man, wait till they get a hold of me tonight. I'm going to have that altar full. The Holy Spirit's going to move. There's going to be fire coming down from heaven. And, and the anointing is going to spread. And God's going to use me. And the whole thing is going to break out into a revival. Oh, boy. So nighttime coming. It's time for him to preach. The senior pastor calls him up. And so he walks up on the platform. And he opens up his notes. And three minutes into his sermon, he can't make sense out of any of it. So he just closes down the sermon with his head down. And he's coming down from the pulpit. And the senior pastor goes like this and calls him over there. And so the young man bends down to where his ear is exposed to the senior pastor. And the senior pastor says, son, if you would have went up there like you came down, you would be coming down like you went up there. Amen. Humility is how we receive mercy this morning.